I believe that when we shine a light, break the silence and the stigma and rewrite the narrative on military mental health, we will end soldier suicide. Someone cares about you. There's a reason why your heart is beating. You still have a purpose. Don't give up. It's important to know that you're not alone. You're not alone. You're You're not not alone. alone. You are not alone. Taking a daily walk is an incredible way to unwind, de-stress, elevate your mood, and reduce the risk of depression. As you lace up your shoes for today's walk, I'm delighted that you're here to join the conversation with our guest, Olivia Nunn, a combat veteran with 20 years of service in the U.S. Army. Throughout her career, Olivia defied expectations and led units previously commanded only by men. As a trailblazer for women in combat arms units, she broke barriers and earned the respect in forward deployed environments. After her transition from the Army, Olivia found a new calling as an executive director of the Work Play Obsession All In Foundation, dedicated to promoting healing for the unseen wounds of military trauma. Alongside her work with BRC Recovery, Olivia is fiercely committed to addressing mental health challenges within the military community while bridging the gap between civilians and service members through impactful storytelling and advocacy. Olivia, welcome to the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Thank you so very much for having me on your show, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share. You have such an incredible journey through the Army And as our audience prepares their Strava app for their walk, I'm eager to hear about the influence of your father's military experience on your decision to become an officer in the Army. So my dad was in the Army when I was a kid, and he was enlisted. He was a combat engineer, and I'm the oldest of three girls, and I am daddy's little girl, and I knew since the age of four that I wanted to be in the Army. What I was going to do in the Army, you know had no idea. And I just knew that I wanted to be in the army because I wanted to to do something that was similar with what my dad was doing. But the one thing that my dad said was, you aren't going to enlist. And I think two reasons why is I'm Korean American, I'm first generation. And for our culture, education is a big deal. And so I was like, okay, have no idea what that means. But you know, he was like, you're going to be an officer. Sure. Okay. But I just knew the end state was that I was going to be in the army. What I was going to do, how long I was going to stay, I had no idea. I just knew that I wanted to be in the army. And um, in the end, it ended up being 20 years. And I ended up first starting off as a chemical officer. I did that for 10 years. And then I transitioned into being a public affairs officer. And I really enjoyed my 20-year career. Yeah, that's that's some great advice from your father and and the fact that you took it to say, hey, education, first and foremost, this is what we're going to do to to set up your career, whatever it was going to be. Because a lot of the times when you go the enlisted side, getting out and and trying to get an education becomes a bit of a hurdle uh, transitioning into the civilian sector. So I'm really glad that he, uh, him and and your mom both kind of introduced you to that mindset. Now, being a, a a woman in the military, they make up such a small percentage. I think it's like less than 20% of our military is women. And since it's such a male-dominated industry, I guess uh, I, I would say, what was your time in service like? Well, for me, I spent predominantly, I mean, yeah, we just said it's a male-dominated industry. I spent majority of my time in the most male dominated portion, which was combat arms. And I often found myself the only woman in that area, the only woman on staff or the only woman in that, in that arena. And, you know, I'm not going to say that it was always, you know, great days, but I would say that I lucked out that I had some great leaders. I had some great mentors that would take me aside and say, Hey, these are the areas that you're doing well. And these are the areas that you need to work on. Here, here's probably one example. I was deployed and I was the battle captain, the day battle captain while we were in Iraq. I deployed three times and it was uh, during uh, my second deployment. And I was, you know, in charge of the talk, which is, you know, a big responsibility. So we're in the middle of an actual operation and, you know, things are going off, right? We're getting attacked. Mortars are coming in. There's an actual operation that's going on. You know, there the troops on the ground are actually being attacked. I'm calling in artillery. You know, we're asking for um, aviation support, you know, just everything. It's just chaos, right? And it ends up just going off 
well, right? And in the middle of all this, and I, I'm talking to all the NCOs that are in the talk, I'm asking for support, all these things, you know, it's it's going off without a hitch. In walks in the Brigade XO and the Brigade Commander behind me, because it's kind of like a, a theater style seating. And they're watching everything unfold. And they don't intervene. They don't say anything. And I think this was the first time they actually saw me in action. And after it was all said and done, you know, they said, Captain Nunn, get over here. And I'm like, oh, crap, what did I do? Just kind of like the tone. And, and they called me to the back and they said, hey, you know, that was amazing. You handled it. It was perfect. You called in all the support. Our, you know, our boys are coming home. And I was like, Phew. okay, right? Because you know, I was the only woman in, in, in that arena, literally the only woman in the talk. But the, the one feedback that I got from, from the Brigade XO was he's like, Olivia, you were amazing. You handled yourself. You got everything done. You got the support that we needed. You're talking to the units on the ground. At the same time, you're talking to division. I applaud you. The only feedback I would give you is that just bring your energy down just a little bit. When you amp up and you get a little excited, everybody follows you because you're the center. And when you get too excited, everybody else gets excited. He's like, you just got to calm down just a little bit because you've got to hold that ground. I was like, okay, got it. And I thought that was such great feedback because, you know, he could have ripped me in so many different ways. He could have said so many different things, but he just gave me such great feedback and it just helped shape who I was at a leader at that critical junction. And that's what I mean by having some great leaders throughout my time in leadership, right? Just, just little small points along my career. That's incredible recognition and, and constructive feedback. I, I love hearing stories of positive leaders impacting our, our service members, uh, especially because that's not necessarily the perceived case for a lot of people um, after they leave the service. They'll look back and go, oh, well, that was really hard or I wouldn't have done it that way. But the fact that you can look back and go, I really appreciated the way that that person directed me. I remember for myself, during my second deployment to Iraq, I was part of a very small team and I was the most junior person. And I remember feeling very, very insecure about my abilities because I was on the medical side and I was the only medical person. I um, had some combat experience from a previous deployment to Afghanistan, but there was a casualty situation. And I remember being confronted very harshly during a mass casualty by one of the staff sergeants because I was trying to call in another medevac for a local national. And he kind of challenged my decision uh, as a junior, you know, 21 year old kid, uh, E4 speaking to an E6, I felt very out of place. Now, I also remember during, during the same time, the early 2000s, a lot of conversations uh, at the time, a lot of women weren't allowed in certain combat roles. Did you ever face any of these challenges of having to overcome some of these either perceived self impressions of I'm not strong enough, I'm not good enough, or I don't belong here? Or did people actually make you feel that way? And if so, how did you end up overcoming some of that? I think it's both. I, you know, I think you know, most people in the military are type A, aggressive, you know, hard charger type personalities. And I, so I think it's both. I, you know, I think there is a lot of uh, pressure that I put on myself. There is a lot of pressure that I put on myself to, you know, perform well, to be the best, to prove that I had a place and a seat at the table, that I'm supposed to be where I'm supposed to be, that... Uh, you know, you know, your, your viewers can't see, but I'm five foot one, right? I weigh about 118 pounds. I'm five foot one. You know, I'm, I'm very short in stature and I'm not, I'm not that tall. I'm not that big, you know, and therefore this, this notion in my head was that I am going to prove to you that my, my gender, my height, my weight, my, uh, my ethnicity does not mean that I am not supposed to be here. And I'm going to prove it to you that I'm going to work just as hard. And oh, by the way, 
the fact that I'm a woman who wasn't trained in the in combat arms, that I wasn't taught tactics, and I wasn't taught the disciplinary understanding of the doctrine, I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to dig in, and I'm going to prove to you I'm supposed to be here. And so a lot of it was a pressure that I placed on myself. And at the same time, like I said, you know, I had leaders that, you know, helped me along and taught me. And then there was, you could definitely tell whether it was overt, um, that there was that attitude of like, why are you even here? You, you know, you, you don't belong here or Hey, you know, especially being the chemical officer, right? We're the redheaded stepchild of the staff. You know, they, you know, Olivia, what are you doing? Go do the unit status report, the USR, just go sit in the corner, just be quiet. And I definitely didn't have that type of attitude. You know, my attitude is like, if I'm going to be here, I want to be value added. I want to be part of the team instead of just sitting in the corner, just being this staff officer that does nothing. So therefore, there was both. And, uh, And I think because I had this chip on my shoulder of, I am going to be someone of value. I don't want to be that person when people look around wondering, why is, you know, Lieutenant Nunn or Captain Nunn or Major Nunn just sitting in the corner doing nothing? Because that's not what I signed up for. That's not why I came into the Army. I came here to be a servant leader. I came here to be a team member and I came to give back. So therefore, you're not going to see me in the corner being quiet and not providing of value. And, you know, and I think the other part is you definitely still have people, men particularly, that believe that women don't belong in the military. And I would say that even now, as I've retired over two years ago, I'm, I'm starting to see a shift of both men and women that really have changed their ideology around that, that women have a place and that they're supposed to be there and that women can have a role in combat arms. And, and I love seeing that. And, and I've seen really a shift of that men are the biggest strong supporters of that. If they can do it, if they have the ability and the capability and they can meet the standards, then by all means. And I love that. And I truly do. And here's the thing. Not every single woman wants to be there. That's not, that's never been the ask. It's those that want to allow them to be there. That's always been the ask. And that's what we're asking for the support. And so that's, that's what I love being able to see the men that are willing to step up and recognize that and support that. It's been absolutely incredible following the transition, especially Post service for me to watch women and f- fill more and more of these roles. Uh, even seeing like the Marine Battalion shift and it start to incorporate um, more women in combat, I'm I'm blown away by not the capabilities, but the level of support in such a short period of time that has come along with that. Because I know there there was a lot of fear being talked about when I was serving in. How are we going to make this look? I know when I first came into the Navy, uh, some of the ships were just starting to incorporate women for the first time. And then, you know, eventually that led to submarines. And now just seeing that opportunity, but also, you know, when you talk about being small in stature, my wife is just o- o- over 410. We got to give her her half inch, 410 and a half. And, uh, <laughs> and we work together. And one of the things that I always have to be a champion of is, is when we walk into a shoot or we walk into a room, people know that she's in charge. She is the person to talk to. And she is able to not, not walk in behind me and be like, yeah, it's me. She walks in there saying, this is who I am. This is what I do and takes charge of the room. And I'm always impressed to, to just see the level of support. So I love that that was a good portion of your experience as you're moving forward and, and still advocating for uh, military service members. And your career took you to some amazing places from this, the redheaded stepchild of, of, of chemical, biological, radiological <laughs> uh, warfare to combat arms, and then eventually to your ultimate landing place in public affairs, where you've had so much influence. Uh, public affairs is a position that I discovered after the military, and the rooms and decisions that we get to be a part of uh, to to help communicate uh, things in a way that the public can start to hear, accept, and change uh, change their attitudes and beliefs about it is absolutely incredible. Can you talk about some of those transitioning into that more servant leadership? Absolutely. I, you know, so I why I picked that career field is because I I've been a storyteller my whole life. I've been writing stories in my head ever since I was a kid. 
And I think a lot has to do with it's been a way in which I've been able to escape. I write stories in my head. It's been a way to escape from where where I am to where I want to be. You know, I grew up on anime, you know, and here's why. I've never been enough, right? So... I, like I said, I'm Korean American, but I'm actually biracial, right? I'm three, my true makeup is I'm three quarters Korean and a quarter English. And growing up in the eighties, it was act white, be white, do white, right? So it was all about assimilation and I never fit in. It was, I was never white enough for one side. I was never Korean enough for the other side. And so I stuck out. I never looked at my, I never saw myself in the crowd, right? I, I never saw me anywhere. There were just never other biracial people. There are now, right? There are more and more people that are biracial, but growing up in the 80s, I didn't see somebody else like me. And so to escape that feeling like I didn't belong, I did a lot of storytelling. So for me to segue into a different career in the military, I just felt at home. And that allowed me to write messages on behalf of the army. I wrote some of the key, you know, I was part of teams that wrote some of the key messages for the army, women in combat, uh, military working dogs, transgender in the military, you know, just key pieces. And then I started working in my last three years in the military. I worked for U.S. Army Soldier for Life, which is basically in the business of transitioning military members on behalf of the army. And I literally went all around the world on behalf of the United States Army talking about the various topics of transition, whether it was, um, you know, education or employment or health and wellness. And I, you know, did a podcast for the army. And I think that's where a lot of my notoriety came from. That's where a lot of people recognized me was because of the podcasting. And I just really loved that mission and what I did and I believe in it, I still do. And and to answer your question about being able to get into the rooms because of what I believed in, because of being able to talk about those topics, whether it was mental health or transitioning or education or employment on behalf of service members about why you need to employ service members, why military spouses are important in the workspaces, you know, those key pieces, why we need to raise the roof and the conversation about it's important to talk about the conversation of why we need um child care, right? Why that impacts military spouses and military family members. Um, you know, why do we have a problem with recruitment and retention currently, right? All of those pieces, It that's why I love what we do because it allows you to bring in the nature of storytelling, bring in the nature of conversation into key places, whether it's at the White House, whether it's at the VA, all these places that I've been able to go to because of the experience that I've had, because of the people I've interacted with. And yeah, I just, I just love what I do. Uh, and I, and I think it's one, it's an honor to be able to do what I get to do. And, and I, and to be able to represent uh, the community that I get to storytell on behalf of. You know, you're right. Storytelling is such an effective way to make an impact and and start uh, changing the way society views things. You know, a lot of people, when they hear about some of the struggles of the military, things that they don't consider is how many single parents are in the military and the fact that, you know, these parents still need to maintain, be, be operational. And so they have to trust their children uh, sometimes with, with, strangers if family isn't around to be able to to take care of that so that they can maintain that operationality or even the fact that a lot of homes within the military communities are also food insecure so i'm really glad that that you were able to use your skills and say hey these are real people experiencing real things and you continue doing that uh post service with the organizations that you do uh, or, or that you're a part of, uh, you use storytelling to continue to bring a lot of these issues to light and also consult with other people. But I know that transitions are incredibly difficult just in general. And when you began your transitions of 20 years of, ser after 20 years of service, you had a lot of major life events happening. Not only was the world dealing with the COVID pandemic you were also in the midst of an unexpected divorce from your husband of your entire army career. Would you mind talking us through that period of life and how you navigated some of these challenges? 
Yeah. So, you know, at the time, my partner and I, you know, him and I were both in the military, we we're both, you know, army officers. And, you know, we had a great, a great marriage and a great love story. And I think you don't escape a career together. And, you know, I deployed three times to Iraq and he deployed twice. And I don't think you do, you escape a career and not go through trauma. And then when you don't, when you don't, deal with trauma, whether individually or as a couple, that you can escape that, right? And unfortunately, our love story was impacted by that. And, and it was, and, and for both of us, I think it was very much unexpected from both of our ends. And so here we are at the very end of our career, we're both retiring at the same time. And now we're both impacted by the fact we're both going through a divorce, if you will, of the army, right? Transitioning out of the army is a divorce. And that is impacts you in such a deep way. Everything that you know about yourself, everything, because your uniform represents so much about yourself. That's your identity, all, everything, right? Your accoutrements are on your uniform. Your rank is on your uniform. How you walk in through the door, you're treated a certain way. And now all of that is going away. And it's scary because your life is changing. And now you've got to go through and deal with the trauma of your service. And, oh, by the way, we both went through through war. And there's just things that we just didn't effectively deal with. And it was scary. And in our just our marriage, our love story just didn't didn't survive that, unfortunately. And it was during COVID. And it was tough. It was very, very tough for both of us. The good news story is that we are friends. We do co-parent our two children. We have a 10-year-old daughter and a 7-year-old son. And, you know, I know that a lot of people go through divorce and they aren't friends. They don't co-parent well. And I am very fortunate to say that we get to do that. We we still get to, you know, interact with each other well. So I am very fortunate and I'm very happy to say that that I get to do that with my, with my former partner. Um, but coming through that in that moment, in that transition, I will say that I hit rock bottom because what I knew in my life, who I was, Lieutenant Colonel Nunn, the pinnacle of my career, you know, I was successful. I, I had this podcast going, people knew me. I had this amazing career. I had this amazing life with my husband and kids and everything that I knew pretty much shattered and I hit rock bottom. And with that, I just didn't know what to do. And I started doing what I knew best as an army officer, right? Which is you go into planning mode, you start thinking and you start doing all those things that a great army officer does. And what do I do? I start planning because I'm a lethal planner. And I figure out what the problem is and who's the problem? Me, right? So, so what do you do with the problem? You f- define the problem, fix the problem, destroy the problem. And I was in a very, very dark place. So I wanted to remove the problem. I was a problem. And that is what led me down to wanting to remove myself from life because I just saw myself as such a failure, a failure at life, a failure at my career, a failure at being a mom, a failure at being a wife. You know, I just, I just couldn't see past that because everything that I knew, you know, and everything that I wanted just wasn't what I envisioned. And oh, by the way, everything that I had shoved into boxes in my 20-year career, I had been assaulted as a lieutenant by my own platoon sergeant on a mission, all the sexual harassment I had to deal with, you know, just all of the negative things that I just tucked away in my 20-year career now had all resurfaced, right? All the things that I was like, I'll deal with it another day, another day, another day. Now, just all just basically, you know, if you can envision a box just sprung open and I can no longer shove that box closed. And now I just didn't know what to do. And I just wanted to remove myself. And that's what I started to plan. I came pretty close to, to, to doing that. And I, you know, it, it took a really, really long time to try to, to ask for help. 
And when I did ask for help, it was probably the hardest things, the hardest thing to say, right? I need help. Those words were the toughest words to actually come out of my mouth. I knew I needed to say it, but I had such a hard time in saying it. Yeah, thank you so much for for just starting to open up about the story. And I and I want to hear more, but I also want to just like very much validate uh, that experience. Um, I know it's not. The sad part is is that it's not unique because I feel like I heard a lot of my own story in your journey of getting out. We can only shove so much into a compartment in a healthy way before it starts coming out. And unfortunately, it's not actually healthy to just compartmentalize our lives. We actually have to open up the door and let some of that stuff out from time to time or else it does hit an actual breaking point where the door explodes and we can't we can't close it. The hinges are off now and we have to learn how to how to now address everything that's in that room. And so, you know, I know asking for help in the military uh, from firsthand experience is challenging in and of itself because, you know, we, we as troops talk about a stigma, but when you get to the leadership level and you actually see troops that are in need of help, leadership just wants to step up and actually help them. At least that was my experience with my chain of command. They said, like you're you're asking for help. You're telling us this is where you're at. Let let us do everything that we can to support you because the unit will carry on, the military will carry on. You need this now, and I know for you being a leader, you would do that for your troops. But unfortunately, during the time of of you asking for help, the pandemic was in full swing. Clinics were closed. A lot of in-person stuff was shut down and the world was scared. So I can only imagine how limited some of those resources were. How did you go about seeking and then accepting that help? You know, you're right. It was it was horrible, right? So like I said, you know, because I was part of US Army Soldier for Life, I knew I knew all the players in in the game, right? And I'm supposed to be an expert at transitioning. And when I finally asked for help and I started going through the Rolodex of resources, the conversation went like this. Yep, Olivia, I know exactly who you are. I would love to help you. But unfortunately, I can't because we're tapped out. And so I didn't know what to do. And they're like, we would love to help you. Maybe six months, we might be able to help you, but really best case is a year. And I'm like, I don't even know if I have six days left in me. So I just want to make sure and be abundantly clear to your listeners that these resources wanted to help me. It's just that they just couldn't because their resources were tapped out just because of the the current circumstances. And I exhausted all of my, my list. And I just, I, I just really felt so alone and I was just about to give up and I tried one more, just one more. I just, just, I had this whisper in me, like, just try one more. And I Googled one more and I found give an hour and I went through give an hour and found one number. I tried one number and it was a lady in Virginia and she actually answered her phone, right? So faith is something important to me. And I know this is all divine intervention. And this woman answered and she was like, yep, I'll talk to you. And as she was listening to me, I found out that she had once in her career had worked on military installations. So she was very familiar with the way the military installations work and how, you know, behavioral health and all of that. She no longer did it, but she was very familiar. And she's like, wait a minute how far are you from a military installation? I said, well, I'm actually about 45 minutes from Fort Belvoir. And she said, are you still active duty? I said, actually, technically, yes, I am. I'm not quite yet retired. She said, okay, you're going to hang up with me right now. And you're going to go to Fort Belvoir right now. And you're going to go to behavioral health and you're going to do an emergency walk-in. And if you don't do that, I'm going to call 911 on you. And I think it was the whole like military in me and about like not wanting to be in trouble that scared me. So I said, oh, okay, right? Because she had all my information at this point, right? She knew my number. She knew like my location. And so I just was like, okay. So I, I, so I hung up and I went straight to Fort Belvoir to Behavioral Health. To, and I stood in line. And she said, when you get there, you're going to call me. And you're going to give the phone to the person at the front desk. And I'm going to talk to them. I said, okay. 
So I did exactly what she told me to. And so whatever she said to that person, because she knew the system, I don't know what she said, but I ended up getting checked in and I happened to get the OIC of behavioral health assigned to me that day. And I, and I began my, my road to recovery. Right. And I, and I got checked in that day and I started therapy twice a week. And she says, okay. She's like, I think you're in good hands now. And I was like, okay. But it it was literally, that is what happened to me in that moment. Because I just, something told me one more, right? One more. She picked up and she was like, wait a minute. And she just, she just happened to know our system. And she said, this is what you're going to do. I am so grateful that you got in contact with Given Hour because it's a great organization that is nationwide available to any citizen of the states uh, to to call them and to speak with with one of the trained volunteers or professionals that's on staff, and that's kind of one of the the big motivators for us doing our podcast is people don't realize the the amount of resources that are available because there's so many that when we go online and we search, some of the top three come up and those resources are generally tapped out. And one of the things that I always I always tell people, one of the reasons, especially for the veteran side or military side, our resources are tapped out is because not enough people are registered. Not enough people are letting the VA know, hey, I will utilize your services uh, if I need to. Meaning that roughly 50% of eligible veterans are registered for care at the VA. Well, the VA receives funding just like any other government government organization. It's based on demand. And if you don't have enough patients registered, if 50% of the people that are registered for care at the VA are using care at the VA, then of course the resources are going to be tapped out. But if you have 100% of eligible veterans registered, they're going to get more resources for their people and then only about half of them are going to be utilizing the resources to the extent that they need. So just a quick PSA for the VA, if you're a veteran and you have not done an annual checkup, that's all that's required, one annual checkup at a local VA office, go in there, let them know that you're a veteran in the area, register for care because people like Olivia may need their service in the dark hour. And this may be the only time that, that they have an opportunity to go there and seek help. I know for, for myself, I did have a crisis and I went to the VA as my first resort um, and they had to turn me away, not because they didn't want to help, but because the doctors didn't have the availability. Luckily, like yourself, I was resilient enough. I was, I was determined enough to look for one more resource and I found that one more resource. Uh, but I digress. Like, Thank you so much for for connecting to the right group and continuing your journey because now you're on this journey to to advocate for these services within our our military and veteran community and dealing with the loss and traumas that you're ever experienced. Do you, in your current state of going out there and helping and and being a light for others, do you ever have moments of of a mental or emotional? "Quote unquote relapse that brings up some of these darker, overwhelming thoughts, and if so, how do you now manage to work through them?" Yes, to answer your question, and here's the truth, and I and I say this right: there are more moments of dark than there are light, and that's the truth. And and it's not easy to share my story. There are moments that when I do share my story, it's very um, matter of fact, and I can get through it. And there's not a whole lot of emotion from me. It's just, it's like storytelling. It's like, yep, this is what happened. And there's no emotion. And there are mo- then there are times when I, when I share my story, then I break down and I can't get through it without sobbing through it. So it just, it just really depends, you know, and I would say like I, that, you know, the past few months has been really, really hard for me, right? I was depressed and very suicidal and it took me back down to um, being broken again. And I, to be honest, like very many, um, people didn't know that there's only a couple people in my close circle that knew that about me, that I got, you know, very broken to the bottom all over again. 
because of certain circumstances in my personal life and in my business life. And I think people, the, the myth is that, oh, once you've pulled yourself out and you've defeated it once, you're good to go, right? It, it's, it's a cycle. And so you have to surround yourself with the right people, the right tools and to be able to stay positive, right? Um, it, because it's, it's a never ending ordeal, right? Um, it's why you have to eat right. You have to exercise. You've got to be with the right people, the right mindset, because it's, it's tough. And then the other part is, is for me, it's advocating for the lack of resources that are out there. And that that's what keeps me going because there aren't enough. I, I, I found that out when I was going through my cycle, when I was retiring. And I still say that now, even two years later, there just isn't enough. And more so is in the lack of resources, when we divide them into two categories, the 911 and the I'm okay for now, I maybe got a few days or a week before I get to the 911. And what I mean by 911, I mean by the I'm literally standing at the edge of the cliff if to paint you a, a visual picture, right? That, that could be the I'm literally standing at the edge of a cliff or a bridge or I got a gun to my head, whatever that may be for you, versus. I'm struggling and I've been struggling, but I'm not quite there yet. I, those, I think, are the two categories of mental health that I would say for our military community. And what I'm finding is that we really severely lack the 911, that if I'm standing at that ledge, what is the number I'm supposed to be calling? Who should I be talking to? What resource should I be reaching out to that if I, if I dialed it right now, that there's going to be somebody who's going to pick up that line in that moment, who's going to literally walk me off that ledge, that it's not going to go on an answer machine. They're not going to say, I don't have time for you. Let me put you on hold. Or I don't, you know, maybe I'll get, get to you in six weeks. Like not, not that answer, right? Not, I'm not technically a trained psychologist or clinician. Let me get you somewhere else. No, somebody who can literally talk to you who's trained, who's going to walk you off that ledge and save your life in that moment. We do not have enough of those resources. And that is the hunt that I'm on. That is the work that I'm on. That is what I feel is my legacy. And that is what I am trying to do. I feel in every fiber of my being, the people that know how to do that, the equipment to figure out what's the gray matter in our space, the people that have the money to fund all of this, they are out there. They're probably listening to this podcast. And I just need to align all of those pieces together because I truly believe to drive down soldier suicide to zero is going to happen. They just are misaligned. Those people, those properties, the money are just misaligned. And I know the answers are out there. I know the money's out there. I know the people are out there. And it's going to take the military community and the civilian community coming together to drive that number to zero. I have so much that I loved about what you just said. Uh, first of all, the dark days coming back. I used to think, and I don't know if I was taught it or heard it or just developed a thought that my PTSD and suicidal ideations would be fixed at some point. And I used to think something was wrong with me because they kept coming up. Uh, I eventually learned over over now 12 years of recovery and therapy that it's something that I have lived with. And the way that I live with it is I do the things that you mentioned. I take care of my body. I take care of my mind. I take care of my soul. I have strong relationships in my life that know the innermost workings of my mind. And they understand that when I say that I have these dark thoughts and I can say what they are to them, that it's not me saying, hey, I need to go to a hospital. I need to get checked in. It's me saying, I need to release the thoughts that are in my mind. There's so much to it. You, you, you talk about your faith being important to you. The enemy that is suicidal thoughts cannot live in the light. And so the more we talk about it, the less power it has over our life. At least that was my experience. After 10 years of recovery, I had my third near suicidal 
attempt come out of nowhere. There was no risk factors for it. And the thing that eventually saved me that weekend was I told my wife exactly what was going on. And almost in an instant, the thoughts were gone. And when you talk about the training and the trained individuals and the equipment needing to be there, you know, I love that you're on on this mission to make sure that 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 those pieces align. One of the organizations that I'm finding that really aligns with what we're trying to do here at One Mile One Veteran because we know that systems fail. Money runs out, people lose interest. The way that 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 a society like ours functions is it's it's driven by supply demand, it's driven by money. And so what I challenge a lot of our communities to do is there is training available for laypersons like myself to learn how to be that advocate in my community. And we've been able to field calls ourselves from people in a crisis and get them to the resources and have the feedback of going, I didn't know my life could be so good here a year later. And we got them started on that cycle so that we were able to get them to that you know six-week appointment with the mental health professional that then was able to take over. But, you know, our community, and this is what I love about the veteran and military community is that we are so intertwined with one another. We all support this mission to saving lives that if we would just take it upon ourselves to do the training ourselves, to be that person in our community. I had a a young sailor when I was leaving my last command, ask me, um, you know, what can I do? as a as 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 a as a uh, sh as a logistician to help prevent veteran suicide and i said be that friend that you would want to talk to on your darkest days and be that person always don't be the person that participates in the hazing don't be the person that participates in the trash talk and putting down your buddies be that positive light always because then people like myself will recognize you for who you are and go talk to you when I'm having a hard day. And that's that was my first time when I was 19. Like that's what happened is there was another sailor and there's organizations like Objective Zero, uh, which is a nonprofit, uh, nonprofit app right there on your phone that has laypersons, service members, civilians, uh, spouses, all there trained, ready to talk to you. Uh, to get you to that next resource. So thank you for 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 advocating for it, especially in this uh, DMV DC area where policy gets made. It's because of people like you that we get you know eight billion dollars passed in congressional budget to go towards mental health services. So like thank you for your important work. Well, thank you. You know, I just like I said, I believe that when we shine a light, break the silence end the stigma and rewrite the narrative on military mental health, we will end soldier suicide. Absolutely. Well, on that note, Olivia, what message of hope do you currently want to share with somebody who is experiencing their own mental health crisis? You know, I believe that I know it's scary and it's tough, but share your stories. When you share your story, you give breath and space for someone else to do the same. You don't have to necessarily share it in a open form like I do, like on podcasts and on my and on social media, but share it with somebody that you trust. And if you're struggling, get the help. It, there's strength when you get help. Seek the help that you need. And more importantly, you are loved, you are worthy, and you're valued. You would be missed if you left. Thank you so much for that message. If people want to connect with you or support your work, where can they find you and get in connect uh, get in connection with you? I have a website. It's olivianun.com. I'm on Instagram. It's the underscore Olivia Nunn. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm also on Facebook. And I would love to be able to connect with your listeners. And I'm also heavily involved with two major nonprofits. I'm involved with uh, Veteran Success Resource Group. And I'm also involved with Pan Pacific American uh, Leaders and Mentors. Excellent. Well, thank you, Olivia, so much for coming on the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Thank you. I appreciate the chance to share. 
And I hope Olivia's story provided you with some inspiration during your walk today. Don't forget to log your journey on the Strava app and link up with our virtual walking group, One Mile, One Veteran, to stay motivated and keep moving every day. Remember, you can also tune into the One Mile, One Veteran podcast on Reese Across America Radio, accessible through iHeartRadio, Odyssey, and the TuneIn app.